is Eric Boyce, President and CEO, Chief Investment Officer for Boyce and Associates Wealth Consulting. Welcome to Charts and Chat for June 18th of 2023. Big data for this uh, past week was the Consumer Price Index, CPI inflation number. Uh, you can see it here on the left-hand side, we've got the, the annualized uh, information. And then on the right-hand side, we've got the monthly data. So you see on the left-hand side, annualized uh, headline number was up 4% uh, for the la latest reading. Uh, the core uh, CPI, which excludes food and energy, up 5.3%. Uh, so uh, directionally coming both are coming down uh, core a little bit more sticky, uh, perhaps, uh, than the headline number. Uh, and you can see the spike. You can see also the fact that we're well above the prior trend line that was established before the pandemic. So we still have a ways to go on that front. And if you scroll over to the right, what you can see here uh, is the fact that, you know, we've been kind of stuck in that four tenths to maybe five tenths of a percent monthly inflation data for a handful of months now. And so from that standpoint, it's a little bit sticky. And you can see why, you know, uh, why that graph on the left hand side is coming down is because, you know, looking out last year, uh, you know, we had some pretty high months uh, of uh, inflation, as we all know. And so, you know, once we anniversary those pretty high levels of inflation on a monthly basis, uh, looking forward to this year, if we remain kind of sticky at that four tenths of 1% level, then we're going to see the, the gains in inflation or the reduction in overall CPI uh, perhaps begin to attenuate somewhat. But as we'll see later, uh, we do have uh, some uh, shelter uh, data that uh, I think will be helpful in understanding why we think that, uh, that we'll continue to see inflation dropping. This chart kind of breaks down the contributors to the headline CPI, and you can see really pretty clearly the fact that goods inflation has really subsided quite a bit. Uh, you see energy is now uh, a disinflationary. So last year we saw gasoline prices up near $5 a gallon, uh, oil prices uh, up well uh, around, you know, well north of where they are now, close to 100 dollars a barrel. And so it was a headwind last year. Now it's a little bit of a tailwind. So you take out, you know, goods inflation, X food and energy, uh, and you take out energy itself, and you can see why the headline CPI is coming down. You still, uh, you see services inflation, but uh, we've seen a bit of a deceleration over the last few months on services inflation, which is actually a very, very good thing because we saw goods inflation transition in a pretty visceral way. Uh, over the last year into services uh, inflation. And you can see that clearly marked here. And here we have from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, uh, consumer uh, expectations for inflation looking out, uh, not just in one year, but over the next three years. Uh, we've shown you a little bit of this data uh, here in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and this is pretty much consistent, uh, but from a slightly different source than what we've looked at in the past. But uh, over the next year, looking for about 4% inflation, uh, this is not inconsistent with where we are right now. So uh, there is an expectation over the last year as a result that uh, the inflation uh, is going to kind of flatten out and kind of end, uh, you know, around 4% in three years, looking for around 3%, which uh, honestly, if you, um, you know, go back uh, to history, you know, several decades, I mean, we were very accustomed to 3% uh, annualized inflation. We just, over the last decade prior to the pandemic, we were just running fairly consistently below that level. On the next couple of slides, we're gonna be looking at expected uh, interest rate levels, uh, short-term interest rate levels. And um, this one you know, shows us kind of a trend line, looking at where the market believes that rates are gonna be uh, at the end of this year. And you can see as we entered this year, those expectations were going up because the economy, frankly, was stronger than anybody had anticipated, uh, even though there were clearly some signs of weakening. But you can see the expectation was moving higher until March when we had Silicon Valley Bank uh, collapse. And then, uh, then those projections changed fairly dramatically. And we've kind of clawed our way back up close to 
those levels now to where, you know, obviously we had a, a, the Fed that kind of uh, kind of paused on its rate increase, but expected to perhaps, at least from the market's perspective, expected to raise rates again next uh, month when they meet again. Uh, but these rate expectations uh, are, are moving uh, a little bit higher. Here we have a chart from Bloomberg uh, kind of showing that change in expectation with regard to short-term interest rates from a slightly different perspective here. You know, uh, as we began the year and, and even through uh, much of the spring, I mean, there, there, was a lar there was a pretty strong consensus built that the rates were going to drop, you know, anywhere between like one and a half to one and three quarters percentage points. Um, and maybe even more than that by the end of the year. And so uh, that's reflected on the left-hand side that we were gonna have maybe one or two more rate increases and that we were going to have some fairly consistent rate decreases heading into 2024. Well, that's obviously changed quite a bit. If you scroll over to the right, you can see that if anything, the, the market's now implying that there's gonna be further rate increases, which uh, is definitely priced in for the net meeting uh, in July, uh, as I mentioned in the prior slide. And then at some point down the road, we, we finally get those rate decreases as the economy slows. Uh, but, you know, basically this economic slowdown, if you will, is kind of from a market's perception standpoint and from a pricing standpoint, it's being pushed into uh, 2024 a bit more. Something that is uh, seemingly confounding the Fed and its uh, interest rate decisions is the fact that you have a lot of uh, mortgage-related debt uh, that is fixed rate. And this comes to us from BCA research, but uh, and this chart shows us kind of the effective rate of interest on outstanding mortgages. And you can see that, uh, you know, the preponderance is, you know, below 4%. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the takeaway is that there's a lot of people that have low interest rate mortgages that are fixed. And so changes in Fed policy are not being transmitted uh, as well through the housing sector uh, that would otherwise be the case because we've got all of these fixed rate mortgages that are not immediately being influenced by the rate decision. we we'll talk about rents, uh, rents versus buy. And in this slide uh, here, we've got uh, uh, data from uh, the BLS. Uh, you can see in the uh, solid blue line, we've got the monthly ownership costs uh, for housing. Uh, you can see that that's been influenced quite heavily by the price increases there uh, and, and also uh, due to mortgage rates moving higher. And you can see that it's, it's rolled over just a little bit here lately. Uh, and Along with that, you can see in the solid green line that we've got the monthly effective rent, uh, obviously not moving up nearly as much as the home ownership side. And so from a relative standpoint, rents have been a little bit more attractive uh, than home ownership uh, just because of home prices moving higher and remaining relatively high, even though they've rolled off their peak, but also these mortgage rates, so the cost of home ownership is disproportionately higher than renting right now. It's, and But, you know, good news is we see both of those rolling over a little bit. Uh, and you can see in those dotted lines, that represents a year over year, you know, either the ownership costs as a percent of income uh, or the effective rent as a percent of income. You can see that those are both, you know, higher than they have been, particularly on the home ownership side. And so it's pushing a lot more people to rent. As a result, we've We've got a lot. We've had a lot of activity in the multifamily construction area. We see a lot of starts related to multifamily, um, and you know, we've seen that really perk up here over the last six to nine months. And we have some data from a lot of different providers. So take your pick here. Uh, it's not just Redfin, which we've shown you recently, but uh, actually Redfin. Uh, asking rents uh, have actually gone negative. Uh, and you can see here the, the takeaway is that the rate of increase in rents uh, is certainly uh, decelerating and has been for some time. It's just that it's really kind of picked up some steam here. And so you see, you know, with rents decelerating because home prices have decelerated 
And in some cases, you've seen outright declines in home prices that rents typically follow at a lag, and, and we're definitely seeing that here. Quick chart on personal savings as a percent of disposable personal income. You know, we talk about these various things that are likely to impact our, our economy. Uh, and ultimately, the markets, uh, if you, as you look out on the horizon over the next six to nine months, um, obviously, when you have less savings available to you because you've been spending it, uh, you've supported your consumption by digging into your savings. And obviously, we, we, we're, we've long since anniversary all of the stimulus checks and, and whatnot that people got. Uh, you can see that, you know, where we stand relative to historical trend lines and, and, and we're, we're lower, even though the number uh, in 2023 is slightly uh, higher than it was in 2022, it's still well below the average uh, uh, personal savings rate that we've seen over many, many decades. Here we have from JP Morgan, uh, Global Economic Research, a, uh, an estimate of uh, GDP growth uh, year over year, looking out into the rest of this year and into 2024. And you know, we've been talking about you know, this sense of optimism that's kind of built into our markets, uh, but we have to be cognizant of what's going on around the world. And usually the US is kind of the cause and the rest of the world is the effect. Well, what's interesting here is you can see this in these uh, shaded bars looking out into future quarters is that the global ex-U.S. backdrop actually looks a little bit better. And so while we're talking about now perhaps pushing back the slowdown in the U.S. into maybe late this year, beginning of next year, and again, that's all speculative. We don't really know. But while that's happening, the global backdrop seems to be improving a little bit. And so, you know, what's interesting is we've got, you know, some, uh, you know, parts of the world that are reducing uh, rates uh, from their central bank and some many parts of the world that are increasing rates to try to fight in global uh, inflation. But, uh, but clearly this, this chart is suggestive of the fact uh, that uh, that U.S. growth is going to slow at the same time global ex-U.S. growth is going to expand. So to be fair, I think the backdrop itself uh, seems to be a little bit better than it was several months ago. Certainly the expectations uh, seem to have tempered a little bit from where they were earlier this year. We've had a little bit better than expected data. We've got that in this chart pack and we've got sentiment that has improved and we have more retail investors that have gotten back into the market and helped to support this run up on, you know, on these AI tied tech stocks. We've got all that in the chart pack. And so, you know, there's this optimism that, that we just didn't have uh, several months ago in this market. So I want to be respectful for that and, and, and recognize that that has been embedded in, in the, the market calculus over the last several months. Uh, but I, I, not to throw cold water on that, you can't ignore the data. And so we've got some really interesting data here, uh, two different time uh, data series that go back to 1986 that have a, a fair degree of predictive power and correlation and, uh, with that. And so in the blue line, we've got the NFIB, National Federation of Independent Business Expected Credit Conditions uh, Indicator. And so it's plotted on a six month lead basis uh, against uh, the labor differential, which is a proxy for the labor market. Basically jobs that are easy to find less the ones that are hard to find. And so when that number falls, then it's getting tougher. And so, and you see that that's rolling over right now, but you can see that the uh, credit conditions, which we absolutely know are tightening up and have been for some time, uh, credit conditions are not going to get easier, I think, anytime soon. In fact, they're going to get harder. And so what this time series tells us that with, with some lag, that eventually you get the labor market that rolls over. And it's been, you know, pretty tried and, and tested here. And so, again, as we've been optimistic lately, data's coming in better than expected. And we've been kind of like wondering, okay, well, is the labor market going to absorb the shock? Well, uh, it may not go into a, a, a significant, you know, downturn or downward spiral, but I do think the labor market is going to soften up. And I think this time series helps us understand why. Now we're going to spend some time talking about uh, retail sales, which is more data that we got last week. And this is kind of a summary of, 
of how that kind of shook out over the last uh, month. Uh, home improvement, auto, saw a big uptick in auto. We're seeing a, a fairly strong automotive market right now, uh, which is actually pretty interesting. So we've seen auto production rise that's helped manufacturing. Uh, but from a sales standpoint, uh, some pretty broad-based strength. Obviously, gas stations uh, are down um, you know, on a one-month basis, even though it is the driving season. Uh, we've had some uh, deceleration in gasoline prices. But outside of that, you know, we've seen you know, reasonable strength uh, in a lot of these other areas. Actually, fairly surprising uh, strength. Here we have the month over month data. You can see here in the highlighted number, it was expected to be negative, turned out to be positive. Uh, and that's uh, a good takeaway. You can see how lumpy and kind of erratic some of this data can be uh, from one month uh, to the next. And, you know, we had been looking at some negative trends in retail sales um, for uh, quite a few months. And so to have two months in a row where it's positive, this is a bit surprising in this environment, so I have to have to you know acknowledge that. On the right hand side, though, uh, you know the devil's always in the details. So you see, you know, in this control group, which as I mentioned earlier is a, a more narrow subset of retail sales uh, that can be easily measured. You can see in the aggregate in the black line, uh, those continue to trend higher, but in uh, in in real terms, i.e. Uh, after inflation, or as they say, deflated by the CPI for uh, core goods, you know, you can see it actually rolling over. So that's an interesting development. So even though we're having positive aggregate growth in retail sales, in a real sense, it's actually uh, still uh, moving a little bit negative. Here we have uh, food and uh, retail uh, sales and the service sector uh, change from you know, just before the pandemic and the shutdown. You can see a large recovery in gasoline, which is much more erratic than the other parts, uh, you know, primarily because of the, the cost of crude and, and how that's jockeyed around. Uh, and, and, and obviously the, the price of gasoline, frankly, uh, a year ago was was pretty high, much higher than it is now, as we've already discussed. But you can see, uh, you know, if you back out autos and gasoline, you know, that number continues to to move uh, higher uh, relative to that February 2020 level. Uh, again, supported by consumers that are finding ways to spend. They're putting more money on credit cards, uh, et cetera. Uh, they're spending down their savings. You know, we've already seen that. And so, you know, they're, they're making it happen. I just feel at some point they're going to run out of gas, no pun intended, uh, in, their, in, their, in their spending and consumption is going to uh, run into a little bit of turbulence. Here we have same store sales uh, from Johnson Red Book. Uh, you can see that those continue to trend down. And so what this represents is the stores on a per, or excuse me, sales on a per store basis uh, looking at the same period a year ago. And, uh, you know, obviously you want to see those positive if you're expecting consumer spending to grow. Uh, but this trend clearly shows that spending is in, uh, in a bit of deceleration, even though we see the aggregate data move uh, continuously higher. Now, on the right hand side, we have retail sales uh, in the control group in the black. And you can see that those uh, year on a year over year basis are still positive, but they're trending lower. They're less positive than they were. And you can see how that really dovetails nicely. And, and I just love these data comparisons because there, there are these certain coincident uh, indicators that, that are, you know, that they really feed into each other. And so in this particular case, in this amber line, it's uh, banks' willingness to make loans to consumers. And so, you know, credit's gotten a lot tighter. Banks are less willing to lend. And so that should translate into lower overall retail sales. Uh, and again, just like we saw a few slides ago, the, the bank uh, sentiment data is moved forward by about six months. So it's a, it's a leading indicator of future consumer spending. And so you can see how the, these two data trends overlap very, very tightly. So if you look at this, you know, the, the, you know, what you would take away is 
an acknowledgement that retail sales are still strong, still being supported, still positive, moving in a in a positive direction, but at some point it has to slow because the credit situation is tightening. Uh, we do know that, and and there at some point it's just going to run out of uh, a bit of steam here. Here's something else that uh, I think we should be paying attention to as well. Student loan uh, forbearance will end uh, in August, and so starting September. Uh, those students that, as you can see here, uh, in in the blue line, uh, you know, that stop paying for uh, their federal student loans. Again, the, the Sally Mays and the private loans are, you know, those didn't stop, but the federal loans are have been held in forbearance, uh, you know, since the pandemic. And so you can see that those balances are moving higher. And so we've got, uh, you know, in this in this case not only balances, but you have number of borrowers uh, that continue to trend higher. And so when those people then begin to have to repay that federal uh, student loan debt, uh, some estimates have it maybe like three to four tenths of a percent of GDP impact, meaning that economic growth will be impaired by about that much because of the fact that budgets are gonna have to be rejiggered completely uh, on, on the part of the younger age cohorts that have these student loans that are suddenly now going to have to be repaid. And I'll have to admit that this is probably one of the more compelling slides in the, in the chart pack this week, something you don't track on a regular basis, but it's cardboard box demand. And so this, this is year over year shipments on a three month moving average and really insightful work by B of A uh, in, in their research team. And, and right now we're negative to the tune of about 8.3%. We haven't seen a number this low since a global financial crisis. And, and if you go back in history, I mean, when you get down to these large negative numbers, you go back to the, you know, like I said, the global financial crisis, you go back to the, the tech bubble bursting in the 2000, the 2002, and then you go back, you know, 90, 1995, uh, and, you know, there's various points where you see some notable weakness in this. But, you know, why is this important? Uh, not something you think about every day, but just think about, you know, you need cardboard boxes to uh, for wine club memberships, for stuff that gets delivered to your house by Amazon, to, you know, having to take your, your Peloton out of a box that got shipped to you. Or, you know, if you shop at Ikea and you buy something from Ikea, it comes in a box, and so if you're if you have less cardboard box demand, uh, that should tell you something about demand for end product right now. We've got some data here from uh, the uh, New York Fed, the Empire State Manufacturing uh, Index data, and we also have business conditions, which I have to admit, in, in a bit of a surprise, uh, turned out to be better than expected. Uh, so we've been watching weakness in the in these. Uh, in this data for uh, for quite some time, uh, but in the aggregate, we actually had the index itself move higher, and then business conditions uh, that have trended a little bit higher. And so we're in this kind of weird lull where we've got data that's clearly showing a downturn. We've got some near-term positive data that, uh, in many respects, we did not expect to happen. Uh, and you know, so it's it's giving a little bit more optimism. Uh, out there, I think, uh, but all the while still acknowledging that that there is likely some slowdown on the horizon. It's just that the magnitude of that slowdown is now being called into some question. So the last slide we showed you the New York Fed. This is the Philly Fed data. So you see the overall manufacturing index is still in negative territory, although we saw the New York Fed uh, was in positive territory. We see uh, the data is clearly off its low, however, even though the last data point was maybe slightly worse than the prior month, but it was better than expected. Uh, and then you look at business outlook over the next six months, you see just like we did with the New York Fed that the outlook and the optimism and the assessment on the horizon looks a bit better. And then something that should give you a little bit of optimism looking out on a longer term basis uh, is, is this chart right here. You see 
manufacturing construction spending moving higher. We've got 100 and almost $190 billion on an annual rate. Uh, and so th this is investment in infrastructure. It's, uh, you know, deployment of funds that are kind of tied to the CHIPS Act. So this is like, uh, you know, capacity enhancements for semiconductors and, and the like. And so, you know, what, what this tells me is that once we emerge from the slowdown, however slow or not it is, uh, that, you know, when you begin to reaccelerate, you're going to have more capacity, you're going to have more facilities, you're going to have, you know, basically the engine for growth, at least in terms of manufacturing, you know, already having the, those, those bricks already laid for that. Now we're going to transition away from the economy and talk about the markets for a little bit. Uh, in this rather busy chart here, uh, you know, we have uh, some things that are telling us uh, uh, some different things here. We've got corporate profits on the upper. Uh, you can see that those have been trending down. We've, we've been monitoring that. We know that. So that's not a surprise. That's in that blue line. And uh, below that, you see the drawdowns uh, in the S&P 500 index. And so where you've seen corporate profit declines, you know, you tend to see um, uh, you, you tend to see, you know, decelerations and drawdowns in the equity market. Well, you know, you're actually seeing the opposite happen right now where you've got profits that are in decline, uh, but you've got the market moving higher. And that's a little bit odd, maybe hard to kind of glean at first glance uh, here at this chart, but it is an odd thing to be happening right now. Here we have some more data from uh, Bank of America. Uh, shows you where uh, fund managers are positioned right now uh, for the month of June. And you can see here, you know, what's what's really interesting is that they're incredibly overweight on bonds and incre incredibly underweight on equities. Uh, and then within, you know, equities, you see, you know, banks, industrials, you see Europe, they're underweight. Uh, even commodities are underweight in emerging markets, so on and so forth. But where you see the overweights in addition to bonds, is you see, you know, healthcare, utilities, uh, staples, and then you see cash balances being a little bit higher because we've got uh, uh, higher uh, overall interest rates. We have a chart on investor sentiment from Fidelity. I uh, really want to focus on the lower half of this chart, and this is the, the sentiment uh, indicators uh, from the American Association of Individual Investors, the AAII numbers, which we've shared with you in the past. And what's amazing about this number is how quickly it can change. And, and obviously, you go back to 2008 on this time series. And this is an extremely noisy and volatile time series here, data series. And so, but it does change fairly quickly, and it has. So now, uh, as you see here in the blue, we've got 45% uh, now uh, bullish. Uh, and you can see that that's come from way down from the low 20s. And you can see conversely, the percent of bears has moved way down from where it was uh, in the uh, mid 40s. And so uh, you see a, a lot more optimism being built in the market as we've kind of like bounced off of these drawdowns, which is reflected in the upper part of this chart. So we've talked uh, a lot in recent weeks about the breadth of the market and how limited it is. And then we've had strong participation from a handful of technology stocks that have kind of played on this uh, AI artificial intelligence theme. And so, you know, uh, the other component of this is we've had a, a resurgence of retail investment. You can see here on the left-hand side, we've got aggregate net retail purchases on a five-day moving average, uh, really moving higher from uh, over, particularly over the last month. But even, um, you know, we've seen, you know, pretty stable and consistent uh, input uh, from the retail sector over many months now. But we had a, you know, a really strong spike over the last month. Seems to be kind of attenuating a little bit. That's in that little circle, that dotted circle there. So, you know, I, I'd say that the retail purchases from, you know, average individual investors have had a lot to do with the markets run up. Uh, and you can see here in the lower uh, left here, the, the appetite for AI related stocks has also been pretty strong, you know, within that component of overall demand from retail investors for, you know, for that type of product. So again, retail investor has been important 
uh, in this run-up in, in these uh, high-flying tech, tech stocks here. Right-hand side, you know, we're going to look again at, at the uh, at the sentiment data. You can see the AAI, AAII number that we saw in the last chart. You know, that's obviously spiked in, in, in a very short order with, you know, all of the, all the market moving higher tends to, you know, help your sentiment numbers pretty well. Uh, and then you've got, uh, you know, uh, on the other hand, you've got, you know, fund managers that are still underweight equities, which is really interesting. So takeaway here is you've got individual investors that have really gone long into equities. And you've got a lot of fund managers that are still fairly underweight. So we've seen a big inflow in equities. I think that's, you know, we've already talked about this uh, quite a bit. Uh, you can see it very well defined here over the last uh, four weeks. Here we have uh, S&P 500 real return index, uh, you know, going back several decades here. And, you know, this is a chart that kind of, it's, it's one of those things that I use to convince people to, one, be invested, and two, stay invested over time. You see the purchasing power of the dollar uh, continues to erode over time, um, but the market's moving higher. And so, you know, what this argues for is don't keep your money in cash. Um, you know, you can allocate to cash, but don't have that be your mainstay and that you, you know, should be invested, even though there are, you know, bouts of volatility and Kind of points of frustration in, in, the, in you know when market cycles turn as they have over the last year but you know if you have a long-term horizon it's much better than keeping money under a mattress here we have some interesting data from gallup uh on uh, investors perceptions of what the best long-term investments are and this goes back to 2011 you can see really the net winners here uh, are gold and interest-bearing assets as we've seen interest rates rise over the last year or so. Uh, bonds, uh, savings accounts, uh, and interestingly enough, we, we see equities uh, not as highly ranked as, as was the case uh, just a couple of years ago. A couple of quick hits on China now. So we've talked a little bit in the last month or so about some of the data you know, in China softening up a little bit. Of course, they China reopened their economy after all the COVID lockdowns and things look great for a while. And then now they've kind of rolled over. You see retail sales and industrial production uh, have uh, both uh, decelerated a little bit. You know, obviously, you know, the response to this is going to be very important to emerging markets overall uh, and to global growth uh, in total. So what China has done in response is they've loosened some credit restrictions uh, and uh, they've uh, reduced interest rates. Uh, you can see here the 10-year government bond yield has gone down as a, as a method of trying to stimulate the economy. And so, you know, if you look at this on its face, uh, you know, which is, which is actually interesting because China is moving exactly the opposite direction from the U.S. Uh, here. And, uh, and so, you know, what this will do hopefully is add uh, more value into emerging market portfolios over time. Uh, if China is successful and kind of re-stimulating demand somewhat. We'll go ahead and end with this slide with a focus on AI and its impact on long-term productivity and ultimately on long-term growth. And, you know, as you can see here, the range of outcomes is vast. Uh, it's still very early on in the life cycle of, of AI. Of course, you know, people have been working on artificial intelligence for a long time, but as it emerges into the workforce and what's the impact on the labor pool, what's the impact on certain jobs and some jobs that may be enhanced, some jobs that may go away because of AI. We just, there's a lot that we don't know yet. And so, you know, I think, you know, the average baseline assessment of Goldman Sachs and the research that I extracted these, uh, th this uh, data from, you know, seems to suggest that long-term productivity could be enhanced uh, about one and a half percentage points uh, with, with a range of basically zero to, you know, five to six percent. But again, you know, we'll know a lot more in a couple of years than we know now. And we'll know a hell of a lot more than that, you know, three, four, five years from now. Uh, but as you can see here, 
uh, the range of outcomes on the impact of productivity growth uh, is pretty tremendous. Uh, and uh, and we just there's a lot that we just don't know right now. That's all we have for this week. Hope you've enjoyed the chart pack. Uh, we'll talk again next week. Have a great week. See you.